Rachel, I'll have the honor of uh, uh, introducing again, since Kara, I've mentioned your name uh, numerous times. Kara Lewis is a researcher um, uh, up in the uh, Seattle, Washington area at the Kaiser uh, Permanente Northwest uh, with a connection to University of Washington as well, both from our earlier work as well as currently. Uh, a co-editor of one of the new journals in the field uh, in leading, as I uh, indicated, uh, uh, an important set of uh, efforts uh, focusing on studying mechanisms as well as the um, uh, instrument. Uh, work that I mentioned previously. So, uh, Kara, thank you for uh, serving as our next expert. After this, uh, this next sec section of the mechanisms session, I'll start with my last slide so that I don't forget to address the question that was raised. Um, so I'm, I'm just showing uh, a slide that overviews our new journal implementation research and practice. And I'm mentioning it here as it is a journal in partnership with CERC and SAGE. Um, CERC is the Society for Implementation Research Collaboration, and um, that was the springboard for our measurement work that Brian Mittman mentioned. Um, we have, uh, over the last, oh gosh, I don't want to admit how many years, <laughs> been working to identify, collate, and rate the psychometric and pragmatic evidence of measures that map onto the CIFR, the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, a determinants framework, as well as the Implementation Outcomes Framework that Proctor and colleagues put forth. Um, and CERC um, really supported that work getting launched. We've actually just finished systematic reviews of 45 constructs and outcomes um, across those two frameworks. And CERC members get access to um, a repository where the information from the systematic reviews is housed, including um, bar charts that allow head-to-head -head comparisons of the psychometric evidence of the various measures that we found. Um, across all of the constructs, we found over 450 measures. Um, and, our, and our new journal is publishing uh, a special collection of the results of these systematic reviews, with the first um, systematic reviews coming out, I think, next week or the week after. There's seven papers in total. Um, and so the, the first ones coming out are the implementation outcomes and um, a readiness, organizational readiness systematic review. So we hope that that is a resource for researchers and the practice community when trying to identify measures that um, might be sensitive to change or um, promise a predictive validity elements, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that, although I was not prepared to do so today. Um, back to the beginning. Hi. Um, Brian introduced me. I'm Tara Lewis, the Associate Investigator at Kaiser Permanente Washington Health Research Institute, um, and I thought I would just launch uh, by giving some high-level summary results of a systematic review we recently completed um, of empirical studies examining mechanisms of implementation across health. This came out just earlier this year in implementation science. Um, I wanted to, to share that we um, looked across different um, study designs and methods and found uh, all the, the majority were quantitative non-randomized. We did see some quantitative randomized studies um, to assess implementation mechanisms, uh, as well as qualitative and mixed methods approaches. Um, and I, I won't go through all of these models, but what I'll show on the screen here is just how many different approaches we found across 50, five zero studies um, that were purportedly uh, assessing implementation mechanisms. I put a red box around the studies that we were looking for. We were really trying to see how many studies were um, assessing a change in a determinant of practice um, that might be a putative mechanism um, and then its impact on implementation outcomes. But as you can see, uh, investigators, researchers were interested in looking at um, the association between three determinants, as you can see in, in number one, and more complex uh, designs, as you can see in number five here. Um, we applied um, what originated from Bradford Hill and was modified by Kasdan, uh, seven criteria for establishing implementation mechanisms that you can see here, and we evaluated studies for the degree to which they um, met those criteria. And um, surprisingly to us, not all 50 studies even met the plausibility criteria. 
um, and far fewer, uh, less than half, um, met the association criteria where they're looking at change um, in the mechanism and also change in, in behavior, um, implementation behaviors. And it, it's important to note that not all criteria can be met by a single study as replication is, is kind of part of this, consistency for, for instance. Um, but we were surprised that um, so few studies met, uh, so many studies met so few criteria. Um, that's all I was going to say about the systematic review, but I'm happy to um, talk more about that uh, after a couple more slides. One of the things that we noticed, though, in the systematic review was the lack of precision around um, uh, co uh, construct um, definitions and classification. Um, and uh, the inconsistency in how um, study authors were conceptualizing the factors in, in the studies that they were doing. And this led us to write a paper um, that you may have seen. It was published in 2018 um, to try to advance our conceptualization of implementation mechanisms. And really what we offer is a, 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 a several steps to generate these causal pathway diagrams. We think of these as theoretical fragments. Um, they're artificial in their linearity. We know that implementation is not so simple, um, but we hope that uh, despite its artificiality, it's a useful starting place for really making sure that we are precise in our articulation of implementation strategies and their mechanisms that they're intending to activate or functions through which they work to address which barriers. And we really try to underscore the importance of articulating proximal outcomes as well as implementation outcomes. Um, we, we just find that uh, these large scale trials that take many years to complete that wait for the implementation outcome to, to change um, present a missed opportunity to detect earlier outcomes that might um, give us a hint that the mechanism is in fact being um, activated and the implementation outcome would follow. Um, we also tried to really clearly underscore the importance of clarifying preconditions for both mechanism activation and, and proximal outcome um, achievement and, and moderators that uh, were talked about earlier as well. Um, I thought I'd mention some work that we're doing. So out of that systematic review, we, we actually found that only, um, only a, a handful of mechanisms have actually been established and, um, and actually not meeting uh, full criteria. So the, the work is very preliminary and there's a lot of opportunity for the field. And so we um, were able to secure funding from a U.S. funder, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, um, for a small conference series, a three-year series that has two aims. Um, the first being to generate research policy and practice priorities for a research agenda to guide the study of implementation mechanisms. There are just so many challenges that we face to do this type of research. Um, and we think it's really important research for, in particular, um, implementation practice. So without a, an understanding of implementation mechanisms or the, um, the processes through which implementation works, we find that um, strategies are becoming overly complex and quite costly and, and not scalable. And so um, we're arguing that if we are more precise in our causal pathways um, and able to establish the mechanisms through which strategies work, that we'll be able to um, build the most parsimonious strategies to support our intervention uptake. And then our second aim is to disseminate this research agenda. So we're in year two um, of three and have various inputs informing this research agenda, um, including conference discussions like this. And so um, I'm excited to learn from you all what challenges you have in um, doing mechanistic implementation research um, and, and hope that you'll uh, contribute to our developing research agenda through our discussion today. So um, if you don't have questions for me, I have questions for you in terms of what are pressing research questions or gaps? Why do you think we don't have a better understanding of mechanisms and what's stopping you from studying mechanisms in your study? So um, I'll be curious to hear uh, what, what you're up against and, and how we can um, move the field forward together. So those, those are all the slides that I had um, for us. 
uh, this morning and wanted to quickly get to discussion. And uh, I have to figure out how to find the chat box again. I'm sure it's full of your good thinking. Hi, everyone. If you have questions for Kara, um, feel free to either put it in the chat or just indicate and um, unmute yourself so she can answer your questions. Thanks so very much. Thank you. I found the chat box, so feel free. Kara, it's Kim. Um, I might just ask a question, the question I was thinking of asking last uh, time around, just maybe about the scope for, are, are people trying to bring in mixed methods into these kind of analyses? So, so I think Brian's hoping people will bring, um, you know, more quantitative mechanisms like we've been talking about, but um, I'm kind of interested in the idea of, because I know a lot of the work is qualitative. Are people looking at bringing mm -hmm. that in as well? Absolutely. Um, almost half, if not more, had a qualitative component with, within the 50 studies um, that were included in our systematic review. And um, qualitative is in, incredibly important for theory development and uncovering um, putative mechanisms. And especially in lieu of having high quality measures, the qualitative will be um, really important. There, there are a few measures of mechanisms uh, in our field at this point. Um, so yeah, important contributions, definitely. What we have suggested in the discussion of our systematic review is that qualitative efforts, uh, although um, open to you know, new learnings that one might not have hypothesized, we hope that interview guides, focus group guides might um, also be theory informed so that you um, have a, a working hypothesis of what mechanisms might be and are sure to explore that qualitatively. Thanks. And so asking the same types of questions um, kind of pre and post your implementation efforts will allow the qualitative even to be examined for change over time in some putative mechanisms. Yeah, that'd be interesting to have. I think if you make it more precise like that and say you, you look at it before and after, that would really help to to gain more information. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. We still have enough time to ask questions, so feel free to put them to Kara. I'm sure she's excited to um, answer your questions. Hi, Kara. It's Jeff Curran. How are you? I have a question. Yeah. Great. Um, so as somebody who has, you know, been dabbling in this work for a little while, one of the challenges that we recently had in an R01 grant that we, we were writing was trying to balance how much power that we might have in our study with trying to specify potential mechanisms. And so there are some strategies or strategy clusters that might have multiple mechanisms, um, but it might be difficult to have power to try to tease that out. Um, mm -hmm. Any recommendations, you know, on how to prioritize um, the testing of possible mechanisms or mediators you know, in a situation of not infinite power? Oh gosh, such a good question. Um, I'm happy to share some materials that we um, created. So we have a, a center grant that was recently funded that really um, elevates the study of mechanisms and have created a stepwise approach for how to articulate um, putative mechanisms and which might be most promising or strong. Um, and so, for instance, um, looking at direct effects 
um, understanding that there's a lot of indirect pathways that might be there um, might be just a way to to cull the potential list. Um, the other the other paper that's a nice resource if if you haven't seen it would be um, the one by Brian Weiner and Megan Lewis and colleagues from 2013, I think, um, that talks about um, some different uh, ways in which implementation strategies interact and um, meaningfully enhance um, implementation outcomes or outcomes of complex interventions. And I talk about things like amplification and, and accumulation. And, and I think those types of more complex pathways can help um, reveal what's really important to, to hone in on. It's not an, uh, an easy question to answer. The other thing um, I would say that our team is um, trying to do more of is analog studies of discrete strategies so that we can, outside of um, the important work that's happening in our health systems, um, without disrupting the, the flow of their work, um, we can start to uncover what um, mechanisms might be of some of our more common implementation strategies so that we can build the evidence base um, that way so that when we're doing our um, embedded trials, um, we are more focused in what we're studying. Yeah, great answer. Um, as you might know, you know, our group, uh, develops and tests a lot of facilitation-based strategies, which involve lots of moving parts and lots and the deployment of other discrete strategies. So, I mean, it does get complicated. <laughs> yeah, to that point, one of the studies in our center um, is taking um, a mechanistic look at practice facilitation um, where we are uh, systematically capturing um, the discrete strategies deployed and the, the research team is articulating the mechanisms um, that might be at play as well as the facilitators are capturing the determinants they think they're targeting and we're giving them an alignment assessment for feedback um, to, oh, to let them know how we theoretically think that that practice facilitation is activating the mechanisms they hope it would to target the determinants that are really um, emergent. Yeah, great. Thank you. Michael, did you have a question or were you just saying hello with your face? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope my video is going to come back on now. Um, apologies for this you answered one of the earlier sessions. I've been jumping between streams. Um, so you've got the proximal outcomes and the distal outcomes. Um, could you give me an example of, of what you're considering each of those to be and, and how confident are the link between them? I had a bit of trouble hearing you. I think I just want to repeat back to make sure I heard you right. Um, what is the connection or difference between proximal and implementation outcomes? Um, so, for example, a, an implementation outcome that is probably most studied is adoption. Um, a proximal outcome of, of adopting an evidence-based practice might be, um, you know, intention to take a training or signing up to take a training. So it's not full adoption. Someone hasn't gone all the way to the training and said, I've adopted this evidence-based practice, but um, it's a clue that they are um, planning to potentially to adopt. To go back to Kimberly's example of the measurement-based care where we hope to see um, uh, where we hope to see um, patient reported outcomes in play. Um, you know, fidelity might be what we really care about, that they're administering the measures regularly, they're informing their treatment, um, and they're and, um, discussing the outcomes with the, with the patients. Um, but proximal outcomes could be things like um, putting the patient reported outcome in, in a therapy agenda. Um, so we're not seeing that full fidelity is there, but it, there are clues. So a lot of what we're um, hoping folks might tune into are um, kind of proximal outcomes indicators that are behavioral um, that could give us a signal that mechanisms are being activated. Um, because oftentimes we can't uh, directly measure the mechanism, but we can measure outcomes that would tell us that the mechanism is being activated. Does that help? Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you very much, Carla.
So there's a, another question in the chat. I'd invite you to um, turn on your video if you're comfortable and, or just your audio and share some context for your question. Hi, Kara. Thank you for the, for the talk. My question is just uh, about the underlying mechanism. I wonder if we have an idea or if the evidence points to being more related to individual characteristics uh, opposed to more of the organizational context related um, mechanisms. Great, great question. At least in our systematic review, we saw an emphasis on individual intrapersonal mechanisms. Um, and I think that's um, somewhat due to um, accessibility, if you will, or a long tradition of um, behavior change theories, such as the theory of planned behavior. That was one of the most common theories that was invoked in studies. Um, that's not to say that those mechanisms are, are more meaningful. And so we definitely need more multi-level mechanistic studies to answer your question. Um, but there was uh, one study in Nate Williams' systematic review of implementation mechanisms in mental health um, that established uh, mechanisms for the, the strategy of engaging opinion leaders um, and, and how um, engaging opinion leaders shifted, albeit um, more intrapersonal mechanisms about attitudes, but um, uh, not a direct in, intrapersonal strategy, if you will. So definitely an important space for, um, for research. I'm, I really am curious about how folks are approaching the study of implementation mechanisms, if at all. And, it, and, and I would love the remaining minutes, um, if folks don't have their own questions, to answer some of the questions I posed. You know, I'm curious if you haven't been doing implementation mechanisms um, evaluations, you know, why not? Is it really a power issue? Is it, um, wh what is it? I, I would love to include your good thinking and experiences in our developing research agenda. So, Kara, if I could chime in, this is Brian Mittman, uh, just to let folks know that uh, the NIH in the States, and especially the National Cancer Institute, NCI, uh, is very interested in the multi-level intervention uh, aspect of this, uh, and is actually uh, uh, conducting a training institute this summer uh, with plans to repeat it, uh, focusing on methods for uh, multi-level intervention, so following up directly on some of your most recent comments, but with an expectation to um, uh, you know, further emphasize um, uh, interest in funding applications, uh, perhaps some conferences. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the broad interest in, um, uh, you know, a group of folks who have uh, recognized the need for us to all uh, pay more attention to these issues uh, continues to grow. I might, I might also just say that Brian kindly joined us at Society for Clinical Trials last year to give um, a symposium on some of these some of these topics and what a lot of people told us was I think they're not comfortable with the methods and I think you know Brian's some of these training uh, programs are hopefully help you know, will help people with that a bit um, but that was one of the major things we heard at that meeting and when you say comfortable with the methods um, meaning like mediation analyses or, or what yeah yeah, I think the more complex analyses like mediation analyses or the post-randomization moderator type analyses. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see a comment by Sean in the chat about uh, how a colleague Jackie Dwayne will be talking about trust building as a mechanism tomorrow in terms of <laughs> engaging practitioners and evidence informed reform. That's great. Um, it's nice to see when, when folks are um, elevating discussion of mechanisms, trust being, building trust being one. Great. Um, so, Kara, um, you know, coming from Kaiser, that is a healthcare system and a, and a payer, and also folks, say, from other single-payer systems, how much is it, do you get a sense that policymakers in these kinds of systems have have an interest in this kind of work as opposed to more of the nuts and bolts of moving the dial in a certain area and then moving on. 
Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, one of my larger studies um, that was partnered with the, the United States' largest behavioral health service provider um, was actually motivated by their implementation challenges. So they, um, you know, kept being responsive to policies and trying to get clinical program change implemented again and again, a new thing month after month. And they were just struggling, you know, that these mandates weren't working, even if they were adding some clinical decision support. So they actually partnered with us to do a study testing, do we need to tailor implementation to each clinic or can we take a standardized approach? And to your specific question about Kaiser, um, they're, they're really through our learning health system actually prioritizing implementation questions. And our new VP for social health care um, is trying to shine a light on um, the implementation strategies that really help integrate behavioral health into primary care, for example, in Kaiser, to then bring that to our social determinants of health work that is really an emphasis in Kaiser right now. So I, I'm pleased that, um, you know, we still see things like they've developed a playbook and disseminated it and crossed their fingers, but, but through the learning health system program of evaluations, they're emphasizing implementation questions. Great, great. Can we go to uh, we have about three more minutes? Yeah, we've, we've got three more minutes um, to take questions. So if you um, want to go on with the presentation, um, please feel free. Um, everyone, um, please feel free to ask questions if you've got any, because um, I'm sure Kara is prepared to answer all your questions. And do remember, after this is just your break, so um, you still have enough time to ask questions. Thank you. And I'll just share some other slides that I have um, while we wait for additional questions, and I'll try to monitor the chat at the same time. But I just wanted to share another way that one um, can try to be articulating mechanisms. Uh, I think we often start with um, determinants or barriers, and uh, a really common one that we often start with is provider knowledge deficit. So um, we have a new practice that we want to see get into play, and we know that our providers, our practitioners, don't have the knowledge to deliver it. And so education or provision of information is a very appropriate implementation strategy. And um, that, we hope, would uh, operate through the mechanism of awareness building or knowledge acquisition. And we think it could really um, make some changes in feasibility, acceptability, appropriateness. We also hear a lot of folks trying to tackle the determinant of provider skill deficit. Um, and that can also be addressed through training, but not just any training. You see here, you can, um, the specification of the strategy needs to really clearly show um, its function. So teaching and practice with corrective feedback, that might um, activate the skill acquisition or skill building refinement and mastery. And that has more potential to um, yield fidelity to an evidence-based practice, whereas education provision of information alone wouldn't activate those mechanisms of skill acquisition. We also, one of the more common barriers or determinants we see uh, folks try to deal with are providers viewing the evidence-based practice unfavorably. And so um, audit and feedback can be uh, a strategy to address that um, and activating social norms um, to potentially increase adoption. And these are all provider level determinants, but we shouldn't stop there. So um, I know we're almost out of time now, but this slide unpacks some uh, more interpersonal or organization level um, strategies to address determinants at, at higher levels as well. Um, and I think just this exercise of saying, uh, what determinant am I trying to address? Uh, what is the precise specification of that strategy so that I'm clear about its function or mechanism um, to yield what outcome, as we have at least eight implementation outcomes to be considering. Um, so I just wanted to share that table as another way um, to try to move into this space if you're not doing work in this space already. Jeff? Uh, there was a
question about um, a place for integrating context savvy practice wisdom as part of an implementation plan. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think that's where we can help refine um, the determinants that need to be targeted and, and um, also the, the mechanisms that ought to be activated to address those determinants. Um, and we definitely, for informing our research agenda, are doing practice partner interviews to, to learn from them um, what mechanisms seem to be uh, most uh, effective for addressing their most common determinants. I see that we're transitioning now. I just wanted to thank you um, for your time and attention today and, and hope that um, we'll get to continue this conversation globally together. Thank you, Kara. Um, do you have? Um, oh, so I'm not sure if it's my job to say thank you to all of our our our, our experts. I think everyone did 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 a, did a wonderful job, um, and I guess it's time for a coffee break. So thanks, everybody. Brian, thank you for all the great yeah. questions. Brian, thank you.